So I'm gonna read the beginning of No Disrespect by Sister Silva. I literally just read it and I feel like I had to record this. <clears throat> A note to my readers. This is the this is the beginning. I never said I was an angel, nor am I innocent or holy like the Virgin Mary. What I am is natural and serious and a sense and as sensitive as an open nerve on an ice cube. I'm a young black sister with an unselfish heart who overdosed on love long ago. My closest friends considered me soft-spoken. Others say I have a deadly tongue. And while it's, that's true, I have a spicy attitude like most of the ghetto girls I know. I back it up with a quick, precise, and knowledgeable mind. My memory runs way back, and I'm inclined to remind people of the things they'd most like to, they'd most like to forget. Most brothers and sisters born into the confusion of North Americas who emerge into positions of leadership to do so less because we're saints in the purported European sense, and more because we have an intense ability to feel in the Africa sense. We feel not only for ourselves, but for the entire African family. We feel our people's pain, the torment, the, their joy, and their happiness. We feel the spirit of our ancestors who challenge us to be more than what white society gives us as standards and limitations. So everything I believe is said to be extreme, yet none of my critics can deny that conditions for African people in the Americas and throughout the world are extreme. No matter how backward and negative the mainstream view and image of Black people, I feel compelled to reshape that image and to explore our many positive angles because I love my own people. Oh shit. I love you. Perhaps this is because I've been blessed with spiritual African eyes at a time when most Africans have had their eyes poked out. I see the beauty and the talents in my people in all areas of life. Our potential is infinite. I humbly thank God for this vision because I've seen African people, young and old, overlook themselves for the span of a lifetime. I've seen beautiful, original, deep tar men whose appearance and spirit resonate with and represent the power of God, feel small in the presence of frail, pale, spiritual midgets. Even seen big-eyed, hyperactive black children sit side by side in classrooms with white children who felt superior because they had a greater ability to sit still. Meanwhile, African ch children have a greater amount of energy that if, if loved and shaped could have led this European world out of its cold, twisted, and bellicose behavior. So, like most ghetto girls who haven't yet been turned into money-hungry, heartless bitches by a godless, money-centered world, I have a problem. I love hard. Maybe too hard. Or maybe it's too hard for people without structure. Structure in the sense of knowing what African womanhood is. What does it mean? What is it supposed to do to and to you and for you? How do you judge a man, an African man? Then again, what is an African man? What are the criteria? What is a man supposed to do? What is his relationship to his family? What is a family? Is it a group of people who watch television together? Is it a group of people who are allowed to yell at and ridicule, ridicule one another, wake up the next morning and pretend that it never happened? Is a family supposed to have a function in society? But hell, who knows what society is? Is society a group of people who go to work all day for pennies just so they can eat and be healthy enough to go to work tomorrow? While we neglect and sometimes even refuse to talk about all of these obvious but crucial issues, young black women and men wander in stupidity and ignorance, glorified stupidity, all dressed up in Nike sportswear and sneakers. The result, when uninformed young African males and females grow up, we become uninformed black adults who engage in relationships in which love is war. At the root of our confusion is a condition and mentality we all have passed down to us. It is a mentality that functions with or without our permission. It is a mentality that functions with or without our permission on both a conscious and subconscious level. We don't discuss this problem though. It is a problem rooted in forbidden topic. The forbidden topic is shh, slavery. 
and the behavioral, mental, spiritual, and money problems it created. You know that little episode in history that lasted only five and a half centuries, which means only 550 years, which represents only 22 generations of Black folk. Sisters sold away from sisters, brothers sold away from brothers, wives separated from husbands, many of them raped by white men who denied fathering racially mixed babies. The African language, languages were illegal to speak. Reading was illegal to learn. Writing was illegal too. African gods were illegal to worship. African ceremonies were illegal to perform. African beliefs and values were life-threatening to practice. Blacks were not paid for their work. Fighting against these conditions verbally, physically, and legally could be punished by death. Loving one another meant a long life of an ending, unending pain and grief. African unity was shattered, as was the capacity for collective organization. This is why, even today, most Black folks find it hard to stick together. Even the ones who yell African unity the loudest find it difficult to rid themselves of an acquired inner self-hatred. This goes hand in hand with the deep-seated jealousy of one another. Almost all African folks in America find it <clears throat> find slavery a hard thing to discuss. Many avoid the subject and insist that that was then and now is now. They seem to believe that we are not still feeling its overwhelming effects, that, that racism is not still a powerful system and force in our lives. But of course, slavery consequences still affect us. That is why this, is very, this very minute, we have such difficulty relating to one another. It is why there is a shortage today of strong, viable black men in the North Americas. Before slavery, we as African people had understanding and answers for most of life's basic questions. Our lives, beliefs, values, and rules were deeply rooted with clearly understood and respected by our communities. We celebrated life and encouraged and loved one another. We had strong families, schools, organizations, and nations. We governed, we governed ourselves and had well-functioning economies, conducted trade, enjoyed sports, and took part in meaningful entertainment. We lived side by side with other Africans who spoke many languages and honored various traditions. We were without problems, of course. We were not without problems, of course, but we managed to work them out among ourselves. During and after slavery, most of us Africans were stripped of the knowledge to answer even the simple questions of life. A lot of the Blacks we call educated are so European in their ideas, approaches, and actions that they can no longer talk to their own people. Their proposed solutions to our problems are not accepted because they are alien to our adapted culture and traditions. A few of our people make a serious attempt to live in a true African lifestyle, but often become so different from what Blacks have been taught is normal that the majority of our people still cannot understand them. What they are saying or what they are proposing we do to handle the most basic issues of life, like relationships, finance, community. Sorry, mm, I forget myself, but often comes so different. We've been taught is normal, what, that the majority of our people still cannot understand them. What they are saying or what they are proposing we do to handle the most basic issues of life, like relationships, finance, community. On the other hand, many of our people have no desire to learn the African way because the African way has been misunderstood, misrepresented, and poorly packaged by both Black and white people in the Americas. Our old African way of life is not therefore considered a successful, meaningful, or profitable way of life, of living. Our balance and positive African way of thinking and living therefore was pressured, beaten, raped, murdered, and legislated out of the majority of us and banished from memory. But Harriet Tubman was different. She was a bad black soldier who remembered one of the most basic African beliefs, that I means we, that if one is not safe, all are not safe, that if life is not fair and balanced, tragedy will fall on all our houses. She must have had African spiritual eyes because after she got free, she went back to get everybody else. She could have just chilled in the North, 
built a white house with a white picket fence, got a light-skinned husband, and died with her fingertips in a jar of light of skin lightning green. But she didn't. <laughs> I'm dead. That was pretty. She could have just chilled in the north, built a white house with a white picket fence, got a light-skinned husband, and died with her fingertips in a jar of skin lightning cream. But she didn't. She marched her big black ass back through the woods a thousand miles, half in the dark, and went back and got her African brothers and sisters. And she didn't just extend a warm hand and a warm smile. She didn't tell them the dream of integration and milk and honey on the other side. She knocked on the door of slave cabins in the middle of the night with her gun cocked and said, it's time for us to go. And when she scared, and when the scared, whipped, and psychologically emasculated black men and women shook with fear, refusing to go, she understood their state of mind and still put her gun to their heads and said, either you come with me tonight or you die right here tonight. It's freedom or death. Ooh, but was this love or was it violence? Was this democracy or the radical ravings of an egotistical terrorist? terrorist? Should the slaves have had the right to vote on the matter or should they have yielded to force? It is with this kind of spirit that the kind of love that I live my life and offer this book, which deals with the African man and woman in America and our ability to relate to and love one another in healthy life-giving relationships. I'm especially concerned with the African female in America, in the Americas, the ghetto girl who nobody ever tells the definition of womanhood or manhood for, the, for that matter. So she slips in and out of relationships, getting chopped up psychologically, spiritually, and sometimes even physically. She's been taught very little about what structure and family really means. Learning as she goes through her experience, her life is a collage of mistakes, scars, and smiles. Maybe when she's 28 or so, I mean, just maybe, she figures out what being a woman really means. But she won't tell anybody because nobody told her. Like a worn out shoe, she throws on the polish and won't ever admit to the dumb shit she did because it's far too embarrassing. She can't believe she was so stupid. So she quietly hides the abortions, the stab wounds, and lies about the men she's had. She puts a band-aid over the broken pieces of her heart, puts Revlon on everything else, and faces the world like perfume on shit with a fake smile and a false sense of security. But Soldier won't hide. I won't hide because the Bible says, to whom much is given, much is expected. And I already told you I was blessed with spiritual eyes. To hide would be too costly. The cycles of pain that come to young women The cycles of pain that come to young women and men from not knowing would simply continue as usual. Plus, I finally figured out what takes many people a lifetime to discover. I figured out to love myself, to understand my value and my power, to please God. I must add to the good in the world and not the evil. This understanding makes me willing to handle the embarrassment of, of telling on myself by exposing my experiences and the experiences of many of the people around me. I hope and pray that many African men and women will gain an understanding of love and life, that they will have a chance to, have, to save themselves the pain of ignorance. I hope they will be able to avoid making the same mistakes, especially our youth, who are most precious souls by showing you myself and my friends who come from various backgrounds privileged and underprivileged i'm letting parents see the real lives that their children must prepare for so many parents have no idea what their daughters are doing and little concern for what their sons are doing too many parents assume that if a youth does well in school he or she also does well in relationships too many parents keep secrets, unaware that silence teaches children nothing. Too many parents avoid looking at the way they have raised their children to fail, to be destined to repeat the same old mistakes. This is a work of nonfiction. All of the stories in this book are 
um, all of the stories in this book are based on reality. Conversations held years ago are freely recreated. Their essence is as true as human memory will permit. The humans, the names as well as certain details have been changed to protect the innocent and the guilty and to avoid embarrassing anyone other than myself. I've taken some liberties with chronolog chronology, chronology, how do I say that? Like chronolog chronological order. So chronology, I don't know, and have not hesitated in a few instances to combine into one character several aspects of different people in my life. The important thing is not who these people are, but the circumstances that each person deals with. Although these chapters are often explicit, graphic, scary, and sexual, it is critical for parents, sisters, brothers, teachers, counselors, public and urban policy developers, preachers, and politicians to know that I have written the truth about today's relationships. This is what we're up against. Anyway, I have no apologies, at least not to any of you, only to God. I intend no disrespect. Bomb. One of my favorite books ever.